we'll get started. We're down one person. Um, Leslie Wheeler got COVID, oh. sadly. So, um, what that means is that um, instead of closing with one poll, we might close with two for each of our presentations. What we wanted to do, I'm Cynthia Hope, by the way, and um, I'll just simply say, can you hear me okay? Yes. This is a small room. This is a small yeah. room we can all hear. Yeah. It can get yeah. loud out there, but we can we'll close the door. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, I, this is my 10th collection of poetry. <laughs> Instead, it is dark. Um, and I'll read a poem or two from it uh, to close. But what we decided to do was that we would each open with somebody else's poem and one of our own, speak a little bit briefly about um, how we approach what Leslie's term, uncanny activism, um, is in our lives. How we are making, we might say, the trouble. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm going to give a look and then I'm going to close the <laughs> And, um, you know, make, if you start to faint from the heat or something like that, do something like that. We'll open the door back up. Um, I'm going to open with a poem by Afa M. Weaver. This book also just came out from Red Hen. And um, the poem is called, When I Think of Vietnam. Thinking of what is new, how nothing gets beyond being already done. I stare at a decimated apple seed some unnamed rascal having made off with the real fruit. My last hope for a spring that is real, not the juggernaut of artificial corn. I am perplexed, thinking perplexity is the door to writing something new, a brave metaphor or the last teenage dream I had in East Baltimore before the naive wish to be thought worthwhile by the grand machine to become a soldier. Then comes the sober sense of dogs roaming streets where there is only blank starvation and the awful stench of having eaten the planet where we live. All reminds me this poem must resist all things that kill, things that add to war's breath. The life that smothers and gluts us makes it tough to see how love grows through a bitter humility. The barely audible whisper of people too wise to believe the lies we Americans tell ourselves about who Americans are and what belongs to us. Small room full of women. Oh, oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you need the door open a little bit. No, I'm, You're I okay. wasn't. I, I can't. Don't song. worry about me. <laughs> no, I just feel like I'm in church. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we should open it up. I think we can no, just. It's just loud. Louder. It's just loud. Well, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 their sessions, they'll probably quiet down. Perhaps. Right? Yeah. Maybe. We'll open it up in a little bit. Oh. This, this poem is from my chapbook called Contain. It's, uh, it, I wrote it in the first months of the pandemic, and it's mostly acrostic and documentary. Huh. Fears allow world leaders to seize new powers. Cometh the hour, cometh the woman, cometh the underpaid, the first responders, the garbage collectors, the grocery clerks and delivery men, 
cometh the people who keep people alive. Oh, the farm workers, the home health care takers, cometh to deliver a powerful message. Oh, heed them, sit at their feet, learn of them. And um, I would say um, uncanny activism, because it's Leslie's term, um, it was a deep pleasure to think about uh, what was to me a hopeful but foreign prospect. And I actually remember when she was first formulating the notion she had a dean that was um, harassing her. And she, she walked up to me at the AWP and she said, I think I'm going to start to write some curse poems. I need to get this man <laughs> off my back. Revenge. <laughs> and I saw her a couple years later and she said, OK, got him off my back. I said, so who are you going to work on now? <laughs> Maybe the president. <laughs> in his poetry, in his essay on poetry, Velimir Klebnikov raises the question of spells and incantations, magic words that are sometimes beyond sense in sacred and folk language. An enormous power over mankind, and this is a quotation, is attributed to these words and magic spells, he writes. They can influence our fate. They contain powerful magic. Such sounds, poems, prayers, incantations, appeal straight over our leaders to spirit. A soul at dawn to the emotional truths of humanity. And this is me. <laughs> As Klebnikov contends, the magic in a word remains magic if it is not understood and loses none of its power. Mm -hmm. I am rooted in song, the ancient lyric tradition, and song, in the sense of poems that might address spirit or God in prayer, but also praise the world attending to the other at the border of the sacred and humane. Sometimes, actually, usually, I'm trying to articulate something other than praise. These days, I'm thinking very pointedly about the humane inflected in spiritual and activist terms in the hope of changing, affecting, or raising consciousness. I greatly admire, sometimes aspire, to write in didactic tradition with drier discursive statements inflected by sonic lyricism. As a teacher, I believe in and have tried to convey the power of poetry, of poesis, to make something happen in the world. So we're all doing that. As I age, the lack of the humane obsesses me. That so many in power at every level make the choice, because it is the choice, of cruelty and indifference to humanity, to empathy and generosity in what I'm calling my uncanny activist poems. I contemplate that choice. I ask why. I believe that art can convey powerfully a view inflected by the humane and the ethical. That poetry is a consciousness. That is what poets like Dickinson, Marian Moore, Gwendolyn Brooks, Audrey Rich model for me. An approach to being that questions the pact, official, or orthodox meanings imposed on the machinations of individuals who never question themselves. We aspire to be what Alberto Rios has called citizen poets, poets and educators in dialogue with the larger culture, 
to address the urgent issues of our times in language that opens up rather than shuts down and takes care to be precise and truthful is, that is, poetry. As Adrian Rich wrote some time ago, thoughts and feelings silenced too long become incendiary components that can connect and spread until, like grass, every blade catches fire. Poetry, quote, in its own way, is a carrier of the sparks. The sparks because it too seeks connection with silenced others. Its spells are sonic, vibrational, shifting the air as they're sounded, resisting, countering the roars of hate and spite like chants that change the tenor of the very air we breathe, filling it with love and care. I like to imagine it matters, that in each generation, it sounds renew the force of the original. And I'll close with two poems. Um, I was debating whether to read you a lighter chant, uh, spell, and I guess I will because with the exception of someone I know quite well. We are a room full of women, so I think you'll get this. <laughs> Gossip. I wrote it around the time of the invasion of Ukraine. We sit in a circle and hold hands. I'm rested. You mumble a curse, then louder. I curse him, though later you'll take back the word. It's whatever. You've visualized harm to the warmonger. A hole, you say, in the middle of his forehead. To wish him enlightenment, one of us quips. You know, she adds, he's had some work done. It's obvious around the eyes. He hasn't changed in 20 years. He's put on weight, I remark. Or maybe it's Botox. We talk as if a conversation could change things. Our words, the vibrations of which might fluster him with thousands of wing beats of new consciousness. Elemental. We spit and spit, drawing around us the chrysalis of sorrow or shapeshift that the beautiful furies touch him. I haven't yet. <laughs> and I'll close with um, a poem I wrote. Um, it's it's whatever, <laughs> um, but at least it's set at um, the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, we were waiting in a long line of tourists, and I observed this. The way is narrow. And the other thing is that I had been studying HD, late HD, and she had very carefully spoken about the figures, the statues, on the front of Notre Dame, um, on the portals. So I'm thinking about that. The way is narrow. On the cathedral, the middle portal is judgment, say discernment. The last is grace. She commands attention with her scepter, fashions herself as offering law. But who am I to judge? Lines of visitors queuing to pass through Grace's doors, convolute through the square, chatting and secular. The river flows hard, boats churning today. <clears throat> Wind takes my hat. I run into a wedding portrait which I ruin. And who's this stranger with her arms grasping as if in desire? A sheep couple cuts in the line ahead of a child who dodges in front, whirling around, a fury chastising them. Suddenly, we're audience to a morality play. Shame shadows the cheeky pair, 
when they try, intrepid, to move further up. It costs nothing to wait your turn, to enter your soul, to leave through the first portal, empty and empty-handed. And um, Pam Ushuk is the author of eight books of poems, including Crazy Love, which won the 2010 American Book Award, and a new collection, Refugee, from Red Hand Press in 2022. Refugee was chosen as one of the 14 best books of poems in 2022 by Orion Magazine. Pam is editor-in-chief of Cutthroat, a journal of the arts, a Black Earth Fellow Institute senior fellow and board member. She lives in Colorado and Arizona. Do you guys mind if I stand up? I feel like this high at this table. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to be insulting. Um, I want to read a poem also by someone else named Joy Harjo, who happened to be my teacher in graduate school. And was very lucky. And Joy always uh, admonished us, you must turn slaughter into food. Mm. And I think that is actually what we always try to do <laughs> with our activism and with our poetry. We're trying to transform in some way. Healing. <laughs> I give you back. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my daughters. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the white soldiers who burned down my home beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you, fear, because you hold these scenes in front of me, and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, fear, so you can no longer keep me naked and frozen in the winter or smothered under blankets in the summer. I release you, I release you, I release you. I am not afraid to be angry. I am not afraid to rejoice. I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved, fear. Oh, you have choked me, but I gave you the leash. You have gutted me, but I gave you the knife. You have devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You are not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears, my voice, my belly, or my heart, my heart, my heart. Come here, fear. I am alive, and you are so afraid of dying. And my... Going to make the trial. <laughs> Such a beautiful poem, and it works in this way. Um, my poem is a, an invocation called Prayer Against Extinction. Holy fits in the palm of the smallest hand, the Perula warbler's blue headdress, wild sunflower breast, his song, Hosanna in the highest, through sweet gum trees. Ocelot so stalking soft, unholy spotted paws, reading the gospels of pack rat tracks, exploding desert moonlight. Holy grizzly bear walking wide inside thick cinnamon fur, 
fur that shifts like runoff river current as she lifts her snout to a hunter's breeze, she teaches us respect, fierce mother love, stiff leather glove of growl to protect even her weakest cubs. Holy, 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 Siberian tiger, her shoulders like boulders rolling under her vanishing stripes. Her songs, the tympanum, taiga forest needs, takes only what she and her scarce kits can eat. Holy Asian water buffalo and his patient wet slate back, ferrying farmers through swampy rice fields. Hear the suck of his hooves, careful to navigate past landmines left by hatred and war. Oh, elegant cloud leopard, lithe ankle dancer, balancing as he runs up the hundred foot trunk above the burning. Orangutan with his Li Po face, his generous Buddha mind, crafts his own tools like raven, like crow, has no need for cash or computer screens. Holy, holy, the shy steps of key deer, skirting margarita traffic, the zip strip of tire skid from Miami to Key West. Everglades cougar, painter whose green anemone eyes hold the history of warm seas from, we, from which we crawled. Half formed and the half formed we are. Holy, 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 wolverines, northern jaguars, pygmy owls, honeybees, gray wolf and red wolf packs, leopard frogs, cheetahs, green sea turtles, ridleys, thousands and thousands of miles of coral beings, blue whales, vaquitas, narwhals, belugas, white rhinoceros, giraffes, elephants, 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 old growth cedars, prairie grasses, forgive us, monarch, butterfly, snail, darters, monkfish, lemon sharks, spotted owls, koala bears, kookaburra, rainforest trees who keep their names secret and to themselves, white cone pines, bonefish, redwoods, saguaro cactus, walrus, octopi, polar bears, snow leopards, manatees, grizzly bears, hear our prayer, save them, save them all, sacred. Mm -hmm. Elephants, elephants, <laughs> elephants. <laughs> I'm a um, stage three ovarian cancer survivor, and to get through my chemo, I started writing these poems, some poems from refugee. Um, I also grew up in, in a refugee family from Belarus, and so um, all of these things are mixed together, and we live very close to the border, and so immigration is a very hot topic there, and the wall that is separating Mexico, that beautiful country, from us, um, and the, the offense that is, is also, I talk a lot about that in here, but this poem is one that I wrote when I was particularly sick with chemo, and I love birds. Do you love birds? Have you been here crazy about birds? Oh, <laughs> Crazy about hummingbirds, especially. <laughs> Green flame, slender as my ring finger, the female hummingbird crashed into plate glass, separating her and me before we could ask each other's name. Green flame, she launched from a dead eucalyptus limb. Almost on impact, she was gone. Her needle beak opening twice to speak the abrupt language of her going, taking in the day's rising heat as I took one more scalding breath, horrified by death's velocity, too weak from chemo not to cry for the passage of her emerald shine. I lifted her weightlessness into my palm. Morning doves moaned, ooh, who, oh who, while her wings closed against the tiny body, sky would quick forget as soon as it would forget mine. Mm -hmm.
one last form from this book. I'm fond of cataloging, and that's one thing I'll be talking about today. This is a, a, a poem for my brother, and also for all uh, veterans who died as a result of Agent Orange. Bulk. Running on the treadmill, I am thinking about bulk the bulk of an elephant blocking sun as she walks past, baby grasping her tail, letting go the tarpaulin bulk of her ears flapping at flies, goodbyes trumpeting from her trunk, tender enough to sense a bruise on her baby's ankle, trunk that can wrap a banyan tree, uprooting it for lunch. Consider the bulk of a manatee as big as a taxi, nearly weightless in the clear blue eye of a limestone springs. Manatee levitating toward the bulk of my brother, lips touching his diving mask, tenderness he missed in his youth. I am thinking about bulk, the bulk of a propeller as it slices through calm waterways, bulk of water lilies manatee eats with flippers bigger than my head, Manatee's utterly harmless bulk, gouged by the propeller's whirl. Or dark bulk, the sheer weight of bandoliers, lines of bullets fed into a machine gun, the weight of a Humvee racking Gaza streets, missiles and bombs vaporizing mothers, children at play in streets, the weight of the Torah, Koran, King James Bible, a mosque floor made of myrtle, its perfume density, bulk of marble and powdered ruby illuminating the Taj Mahal by full moonlight. I am thinking about bulk, my brother's six foot three inch bulk, his large hands stroking the manatee's face, both of them weighing less in water than a bale of straw, squinting at one another, their graceful, balancing, lithe as clouds. I am thinking about bulk, the small bulk of a seven-year-old refugee detained and dying of dehydration and high fever on a border patrol bus. The bulk of that mistake, lead tears and kneeling the world. I am thinking about bulk and the female elephant and the weight of tusks and the African sun branding everything. There is the bulk of 1,000 pounds of elephant fed daily to troops slaughtered by wildlife guards because of a lack of beef. Within a decade, this bulk will cease to be. The weight of guilt passes from husband to wife, father to son, to son to daughter to son, a feather of guilt that stops all flight. I am thinking about bulk, the bulk of flowers, say gardenias, or tuberoses, or lilacs in the spring. The weight of perfume, funereal, lotus blossoms, manatee hugs to her chest to eat. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to have to read off my computer. <laughs> because my, I bought this computer and it's not compatible with my printer, so. Um, and I can't read off my phone. My students do that, but it's just not good at it. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you mentioned Alexander Klevnikov because um, I come from the same kind of poetry uh, tradition that he does. Um, my grandfather was Belarus, and um, his father came from Siberia mm -hmm. across Mongolia to Kazakhstan and then down and then up to Belarus. My grandma was Czech. And she was also a seer and an herbal healer. And so I come from a long tradition of people who have very spiritual leanings. Um, when my grandma came to this country, she was sold into slavery. And um, to get away from that slavery, she was mm, 16 years old. And you can imagine what happened to her. But um, she ran away, and she ran away with the circus, where she sang and danced in the circus until she met my grandfather, who um, didn't turn out to be so great either, <laughs> but at least she, um, she you know, escaped her circumstances. Sorry. 
And my father's first language was Russian. And I grew up around people who spoke other languages. So my rhythms are a little bit different than other people. When I was in graduate school, my teacher, Patricia Gerdeke, um, at University of Montana said, your, uh, your rhythms are Native American. And I said, well, maybe because I grew up with six languages, you know, and they're all. And then when I was working with Navajo people, because I've worked a long time with indigenous people and kids and, and adults, and I have a lot of indigenous friends, but I learned that the Navajo language is very similar to Russian, and it has the same cadences, and that was really interesting to me, you know, to, to hear that and to know that. Um, so on the Belarus Czech, uh, Mongolian side, Siberian side, my love of poetry comes from the oral tradition and from written poetry. Uh, Russians, and that includes Belarusians, have a firm love and reverence for poetry. My grandmother came from Czechoslovakia, a country that was founded by a poet king, good King Wenceslas. Prague was and is the Eastern European center for music and culture. My grandmother was a seer, as I said, and also she was not a rich woman. Visual art in the form of Maxfield Parish prints hung in my grandma's house. We listened to classical music, uh, Bach, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff. I just lost my screen again. I'm going to have to keep touching this thing. The new computer started. Rachmaninoff, um, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, Mozart, Bach. When my dad had hangovers, he used to listen to Bach, and so I learned a lot of Bach, <laughs> um, as well as folk tunes, and he used to sing to us. You know, so we have these kind of rhythms in our heads, and I, I think that translates into my poetry, too, and I, I think you can hear that I have really strong rhythmic lines. Um, and, and my mom, who was a singer, um, not a professional singer, but she had a beautiful voice, and she sang in the choir, and she was, you know, really, had this really belt out beautiful voice. Um, she used to sing, uh, she used to like Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, the Pointer Sisters, and my mom used, would run around the house, or not run around, but, you know, dance around the house singing Blue Velvet, or Summertime. Summer in New York, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, and I loved all these old songs. Uh, my mom and dad both read to me, and I loved best the nursery rhymes in English and in Russian. Their rhythms lodged in my tiny body and nestled in my genetic makeup. My father was also a union steward and a uh, decorated hero in World War II. But my family had its own problems with our heritage in this country because we were often thought of as enemies. I um, remember being in school, in high school, and being put on the communist list, which I didn't even understand. It was a small rural community in Michigan. So, um, and, and think people would like write things like, um, commie bastard on my dad's tractor. We lived on a farm, right? And we weren't communists, which was really hilarious, I guess. But So that, that sense of justice and injustice really permeated my poem. My dad being a, a union steward, one of the things he did was get the right for black women to use the bathrooms at the Oldsmobile factory in Lansing. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, which should have been automatic, of course, you know. So I grew up with a sense of what was right and what was wrong in the world. And I think that's why my poetry is always concentrated on those things. Um, often Russian poetry like Akhmalova, Pasternak, Svetaeva sounded and still sound like high prayer or, or an incantation or a wizard spell to me sometimes. Um, that's due to the strict rhyme schemes of traditional Russian poetry. Um, and let's see what else I wanted to say. I, um, I listened and learned as a child the Russian language. I learned English. I listened to Czech. I wasn't very good at Czech, but I could say you know, some things in Czech. I grew up with my grandma because my, my own mother, um, and it wasn't her fault, but she was severely bipolar and sometimes schizophrenic. So she was often in mental institutions and was not available to be a mother. So my grandma raised me, which was really fortunate for me because she loved me and I loved her. So um, I don't feel bad about that at all. But those rhythms of, of Czech and Polish, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, Hungarian, Macedonian all kind of mix in my own sense of what language is and, and that kind of internal rhyme. 
and um, and I use a lot, as I said, of cataloging, of listing, and for emphasis, and also internal rhyme for emphasis. It's just the same thing that a preacher does, you know, hmm. in the King James Bible. Da -da 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 so that repetition um, is, is one of my biggest tools and also the cataloging. And that's why I chose Joy's poem, I Give You Back, because it's basically a catalog poem. And if you looked at it on the page, all of these lines are, are conti you know, they contained in them, themselves. I am not afraid to be angry, I am not afraid to be joy rejoice, I am not afraid to be black, I am not afraid to be white. That, creates its own rhythm and its own emphasis. Each one of those is a fist or a gavel. You know, and that's what we hear is something um, authoritative. So thank you. <laughs> has a second full-length collection, Museum of the Soon to Depart. It is forthcoming from Carnegie Mellon University Press. Yeah. <laughs> I was glad to hear that, since we had conferred a bit about where, where in the world to find the press. She's also the author of All Night It Is Morning, which is, is it Diagonos? Part of uh, Bill Lavender's publications and four chapbooks. She holds an MFA from the program uh, uh, for writers at Warren Wilson, and she teaches at the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts. Her work has recently appeared in such journals as the Southern Review, Ecotone, and the Journal of American Medical Association. Mm. Andy, welcome. Oh, thank you. I was thinking about, um, Allison, you said like it feels like we're in church. <laughs> and I was thinking how, um, given the topic, that I wanted to invite people, if, if you feel so moved, to you know say something if you want. I feel like you know we read the poems. People do you know, like, if you want to say, you know, ashe or aho or amen or yeah, you're right or whatever, you know, feel free to to vocalize if, if you like. So no pressure. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with um, a poem from Diane de Prima's Revolutionary Letters. Uh, which this is the 50th anniversary, and mm -hmm. I had not read them as a collection. I've been reading them and have been so struck by how current they feel. Um, so I'm going to stand up too because it feels like for this poem I should stand up. Okay, so this is Revolutionary Letter number 35. Rise up, my brothers. Do not bow your heads any longer or pray except to the spirit you waken. The spirit you bring to birth, it never was on earth. Rise up, do not droop, smoking hash or opium, dreaming sweetness. Perhaps there will be time for that. On the long beaches, lying in love with the few of us who are left. But now the earth cries out for aid. Our brothers and sisters set aside their childhoods, prepare to fight. What choice have we but join them? In their hands rests the survival of the very planet, the health of the solar system. For we are one with the stars, and the spirit we forge they wait for. Christ, Buddha, Krishna, Paracelsus had but a taste. We must reclaim the planet, reoccupy this ground. The peace we seek was never seen before. The earth belongs at last to the living. Mm -hmm. I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I guess um, in keeping with revolutionary things, um, I'm, I'm going to read this poem that's on the back of my chapbook, um, The People is Singular, which was a um, collaboration with Salah Rashad, um, photographer in Egypt. 
Um, so this is from during the Egyptian Revolution. Um, I lived there for a couple years during the revolution, and this um, the photographer was was there during like the 18 days that are in the beginning, and this so her photos are from in, inside of it, and and my reflections were more from kind of a distance and like what does it mean to write about things that are um, not necessarily ours, I and mean, that's something I think a lot about. But anyway. Um, warning. The revolution is not good for personal hygiene. Not good for sleep. Not good for business. The revolution is not good for bill paying. Not good for fornication, for beard trims. The revolution is not good for moderates of any stripe. Not good for tending lettuces. Not good for shoe soles. The revolution is not good for any skin condition or back problem. Not good for aversion to the cold and wet or hot and dry. It is not good for thirst, for calling your grandmother, for hard drives or phone chargers. Not good for relieving yourself, for getting your hair cut, your teeth pulled, your prescription filled. It is not good for uninterrupted television viewing or buying bathing suits, for the cost of bread, or beat for good lawyers if there are any unjailed and able. It is not good for schoolwork, for square meals, not good for novels or symphonies or murals and oils or acrylics. It is not good for blind studies, so poetry is fine. <laughs> and another uh, revolutionary poem. Um, so this is, if you can see it, but there's this I have some of these if you want to look at it later, but this is this um, guy, that a, a revolutionary that I saw uh, in the news one day during the 18 days, and he, he's praying, um, he's a Muslim praying, um, like at dawn, doing the dawn prayers, but he's really bandaged up. I mean, he's really been through it, his head's wrapped, he's, uh, he's got, uh, you know, some revolutionary slogans on his bandages uh, written with marker um, and, and he's got this peaceful face and I was just so moved by this by this face and I imagined him you know on a prayer card so I had it printed like that so I grew up Catholic and then being in a primarily Catholic city I see these prayer cards all the time and um, I imagined him as a saint of revolution and kind of inhabited the language that I grew up with from the backs of prayer cards. So this is, this is um, on the back of the prayer card. <laughs> Petition. Oh, blue hooded face taped with gauze in the news blog, broken arm held by a strap. Twilight halos you with smoke. Around your ribs, clean bandages, two letters, sheen and noon, halved by your jacket zipper. Your eyes aim skyward, certain of a looking back. Pray for us who cannot. For us who watch and think we're free. Pray for calm and brick and rubble and rifle shot and tear gas tears, water cannons, tanks, riot truck cages. Pray for us under boot and chain, under house arrest, under plush wings of buildings with mirrored walls and marble floors over fleas, warrants of us in solitary, rendered into holes. Oh, holy, pray for us as you pray there, smooth-paced, between lines of breaking news, breaking glass, pillar standing in the ruins, patron saint of revolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I carry my, my prayer cards now, too. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I don't have anything prepared to read. I, I have a lot of thoughts, because I really, really enjoy um, engaging with this idea. And I, I think that the two things that I'm kind of thinking about, um, that maybe, maybe some of you have thoughts about, because I'd love for it to be a conversation. But um, one thing I'm thinking about is spells as ways to speak to and with the dead. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, a Belarusian uh, poet, uh, Valjina Mort, um, I, I yeah. heard her say something that 
I'll probably get wrong, but it was something like um, poetry is the language the dead used to speak to us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's so Russian. <laughs> right? I mean, and so, I, and I thought, it made me think about the, the first poem I remember writing, and I was upstairs in my Nana's house. Um, I grew up in southern West Virginia, but my mom's side of the family was from like outside, like working class Boston suburbs, and, which was very exotic to us in West Virginia. Um, and I was upstairs in her house, and she had, you know, she had all these, she was like Irish Catholic and had all these um, crucifixes around, and like there was one that had you know, the glue or, or whatever it was, some sort of paint from the side of, of Christ's body and it somehow like changed colors and dripped and weren't like, oh my God. You know, so that there were all, all kinds of just weird spooky things around, like relic type situations. <laughs> and I, I went up there, I remember going up there and thinking about my grandfather had, had died a few years before and thinking, wow, I need to just like feel something up here, like felt spirit, you know. And I, I like both did and did not want that to continue, right? I, I was really frightened and yet I wanted to engage with it. And I wrote a poem almost like a spell to comfort myself. Um, I don't know where it is or you know, what it said, but I remember very clearly that moment. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that and about um, in different traditions so I grew up Catholic, I'm married to a Sufi Muslim. I you know, have been you know, gratefully invited into some Santeria traditions um, and studied Buddhism for a while. So I kind of you know, had a lot of different uh, experiences with the way people interact with, with spirit, for lack of a better word, I guess. And one thing I notice is, um, we talk about repetition and you know, kind of, the repetition of sound, and um, I recently went to a funeral for uh, someone who had passed, and it, suddenly and, and shockingly, and we were given like a little um, thing where we could we could say the chant, the Buddhist chant, together, and how comforting that was. Even though I had no idea what it, I was saying, it was just like, oh, we're we know what to say now. Like we have something to say. Please give me something to say with other people. And so I think sometimes like that early experience with writing the poem or that kind of experience is it's a comfort to have something to say. Um, so that we're not just looking at this kind of, you know, ab abyss, looking into the abyss of the, you know, what happened. <laughs> have um, have no words for it. And also the idea in Santeria of calling on the ancestors and the spirits to come down, you know. Um, saying their names. And saying their names. Mm -hmm. And yes, and that's the other thing I was thinking about. So I was thinking about the dead and I'm thinking about revolution. So, and that, that makes me think of, I was thinking about chanting in the streets as kind of spells. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we say is say her name mm -hmm. or say his name. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, you know, they're not, they're, we, it's like a, a spell against erasure, you know, mm -hmm. that this is, let's, let's call them down, let's say their name, and then they, they you know, they no, exist, they don't, die. They they don't, don't die, die, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it's, they're kind of spells for, for life. Yeah. Um, and also in, in Egypt, there was, I, I brought a couple of chants from there because I was so struck by, by the chants there. Um, like the, the main one that they hear is or the main one that, that one would hear. Now there's not any, and that you know silencing is is really horrible because of what it means. Because the people that used to chant these things often are you know, dead, uh, imprisoned, or or simply silenced for now. But when there was this great you know thousands and tens of thousands of voices, isha yuri iska ternazan which, and sorry, excuse me if anyone speaks Arabic because I don't do it well. Um, but um, it, it means the people want, the people want the fall of the regime. And, and Arabic scans totally differently when it comes to poetry, but I'm, I translate it into our own rhythms, and so, you know, I hear, 
you read it's got to an exam, so I hear, you know, iambic tetrameter with that <laughs> final anaplastic, you know, substitution, and um, and it's really catchy, you know, you really hear it, you know. Um, and then there's another one that um, is even harder for me to, to say, but um, I'm going to try. Amon, hafla, hatra, asa, lissa, pasidri, lakru, sasa. So that one rhymes, you can hear, mm -hmm. and that's basically trochaic tetrameter. Mm -hmm. So again, there's this like really set rhythm, mm -hmm. but also it translates really well. I really like this one. Have a party, bring a dancer. In my chest, there's still space for a bullet. Oh. Oh. I mean, yeah. dance, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and that says a lot about the. The attitude then of just like, you know, the fearlessness of that. Mm -hmm. um, and the very dark humor yeah. of it as well. So just thinking about the, the collective voice for one thing, the people want, the people want, um, and, and the rhythm of it to make this happen. And actually it did happen. I mean, the regime did fall, unfortunately, you know. Um, Hydrolyte, you know, like another one came up. Um, so, but it, it did it did work in that sense. Um, so yeah, the naming I think in the street, the say her name, say his name, and then the, the chanting in kind of um, this rhythmic unity. There's a great comfort in that, and there's a great power in that, mm -hmm. and a unity. Yeah, a way that rhythm can create unity. Yeah, and a community. In a community, yeah, <laughs> and look behind. Right. Um, so th those those are right together. Yeah, right, right. So those are those are some of my thoughts, and um, I don't know, I don't know other people. Well, there are probably other. Ch I'm sure there are other chants, but but I don't know. I think there's water other. is life. Yeah, yeah, water is life. And we thought at this point you might have some comments. You might have some things to share, or ask, or say. We have, a, we have like three minutes, but it's <laughs> noon, so I don't think there's any other. Open the door and open your hearts and minds for a few minutes. Well, that, that idea of, of rhythm, um, you know, I, I really like that idea of rhythm, and it kind of means that it's that the poems and the words are not just through the mouth, but it's through your whole body. Exactly, it yeah. lodges in your cells. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's where it comes from when you're writing. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like I like that too. Yeah. When when what you were saying, uh, Pam, about your mother, you know, dancing, um, you know, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a dance. It's kinesthetic as well as as well as. Well, do you ever do any of you have this experience when you're writing that your body vibrates mm -hmm. like a tuning fork, mm -hmm. or you're finished and you know a poem is really good because you're like shaking a little bit? Mm -hmm. Do you ever have that experience? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I'm thinking. I, yeah. I attribute it to too much coffee, but. <laughs> writing bulk, I had that experience. By the end, my body was like shaking. But well, that, that, yeah. that's an element of channeling, too. Mm -hmm. I, I was asked recently, because this was written in a kind of intensity uh, of altered consciousness in about 40 days, from which I didn't vary. I, my body would go around and would make dinner. It would to, you know, go out shopping and do what it had to do, but I never left that state of mind until the last poem, mm -hmm. when I knew I was done mm -hmm. um, in that way, wow. and um, the, it, it was quite um, different from any other experience of writing, but I was asked, were you channeling? I'm, I'm not sure. I was definitely communing. There was a series of these 
visual forms that were created as uh, meditations, forms on which to meditate about containment. Mm -hmm. And I just had a deep, visceral. Was that your ekphrastic book? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the, 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 the visual elements were channeled as well? Um, I don't know. They, this is by the artist Morgan O'Hara, who was in lockdown in Germany. Okay. So she was literally not imprisoned, uh, you know, formally, but could not leave in the first months mm -hmm. of the the lockdown, the European lockdown, which was very strict. And so she painted. She was there as a distinguished visiting artist, and sent me this series. And uh, it's okay. as if, you know, yeah. we had a mind meld sort of thing. We had a conversation. Yeah. We had a conversation in our, our media. Our media. Wouldn't it be yeah. interesting to have an exhibit of the, the yeah. birds and the art? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been involved in those a couple yeah. times, and they're really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah where people would give you a painting, you know, like uh, uh, Luis Jimenez. The Mexican artist I did that with, and it was really fabulously interesting because we come from such different cultures. I think you had your hand up. Yeah, and a quick two comments and a question. Thank you for this panel. I'm, I'm thrilled the way you melted it and each gave such a unique perspective that was inspiring and moving, so thank you. And how wonderful for you to study one of my favorite poets of all time, John Hardrick. <laughs> what an experience, so thank you. And a question, both of you know the Belarese poet, Belarus poet, but I don't. So what was the name? Valshina Mort. So M-O-R-T is the is Valshina V A L J J E N A or Z. Right. Well this is Z H. Yeah. In Russian it would be Z Z H, which is a J. Yeah. In, our, yeah. in English. Yeah. I'm not good at English. You better do that. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I think the way they, that, that's transliterated B A L Z H Y N A. Her latest book is Music for the Dead, Music for the Dead and Resurrected. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, and Mona Lisa. <laughs> Thank you for your question. This is the Poet Laureate of Louisiana. Yes. Wow! Well, it's an honor to have you here. Did you, you had a, oh, it was just Monday. I was wondering about where the revolution that we were talking about was. Oh, yeah, in, in the now. 60s. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one that I was reading. No, the one, um, yeah, was the, the Egypt, Egypt the Arab Spring, Spring the, the Egyptian Arab Spring. Revolution. Uh -huh. And where the. the Patron saint, where was that? Yeah, that was in Egypt. In Egypt yeah, um, that was in the Egyptian Revolution, so like 10, 10 years ago, and it was right. over. Yeah. So, so we break the spell. Yeah. Oh, the mundane. So sorry. He, yeah, he was a revolutionary. Yeah, and she reinvented mm -hmm. that saint revolution, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. New Orleans has done a bit of. Oh. Saint mm -hmm. is a fragile uh, saint. Fragilis? I'm forgetting the name of it. You do know about it. No, we truck with a lot of saints. Right? Yeah, we do yeah. truck with a lot. <laughs> um, we have created a couple of exercises. If you feel like oh, um, you're writing oh, you would like a yes. 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 Yes.